The 2015 Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. Välkomna. Um, yes, my name is uh, Charlotte. And uh, maybe you know me, I'm from Sonia. And uh, I'm going to uh, talk now about uh, Gyotamol, Gyotnis, yeah, Workmans, yeah, and uh, basically about the island dialect that wants to be language. <laughs> and the title is a bit provocative, but I'll go into it. Okay. So here's um, a sound bite for you. So if you speak Swedish, maybe so I can turn off the lights again. And the, the people who sit close to the door maybe can be responsible for letting you close quietly. Um, okay. So if you speak Swedish, you probably <laughs> recognize a bit of that. Yeah. So today, I'm going to be into some Swedish languages and dialects. I'll go into the definition of the dialect. I'll tell you a bit for comparison about Eldalia, Eldalsko, Eldalska, Eldalsmo. I'll go into some about dialect identity. Then uh, I'll jump into the history of uh, Gutnish and uh, some into modern Gutnish. Okay, so this is uh, Sweden. And if you went to my last lecture, you uh, know where it is in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, the official language in Sweden since 2009 is Swedish. Surprise! Uh, but there are also some official national minority languages, and they were actually official languages before Swedish was chosen as an official language. Uh, Finnish, Nienkieli, Sami, Romani, and Jiddish. Um, and the, there are some um, um, uh, there are some reasons for them being chosen because they've been spoken for a long time in the country, and it was seen as more relevant to protect minority languages than to have like a real official language. So that's why they got the status as official national minority languages before Sweden decided that Swedish should be the official language. Um, there's also a Swedish sign language. Uh, this uh, is not uh, like this has not been officially recognized. Uh, then there's also, for example, Alfredian, which I will go into, and uh, Gutnish, which is what this presentation is about. And there's more, which I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what you can see here is uh, basically the map of the different Swedish dialects and uh, like the main regions for different types of dialects. And um, yeah, so you see in the south, they have a special type of uh, way of speaking in uh, Jerusalem, in Sialan, and in uh, Norrland, the biggest part of Sweden. But uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, Gotland, of course. And uh, also in uh, in the east, like the former east part of Sweden, Finland. <laughs> the kingdom of Sweden, Finland. Okay, so the question is if uh, something is a language or a dialect. Um, there's a very creepy quote for this, which is a language is a dialect with an army and a navy, and this was popularized by uh, Max uh, Reinhardt. And um, there's also the other saying that the language is a dialect uh, with a flag, and uh, there's a flag. <laughs> Uh, but as we know, many languages started out as unknown dialects spoken by an unknown tribe somewhere in the middle of nowhere, such as Castilian Spanish, English, 
Arabic, and uh, standard German. And um, if we're going to uh, about <laughs> it is here. Uh, um, so very famous Victor. <laughs> so these, these are all uh, like they started out as dialects, and now they took over the world. Everyone knows them. Those are standard languages. But um, we also have uh, languages that might be considered uh, dialects. If you just look at Helsinki, there they are. Yes? No? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Victor, for example, uh, considers Scandinavian to be one language in one dialect continuum. And uh, in the beginning, I was very skeptical. She's like, I don't understand Danish. <laughs> uh, but then I realized, OK, I can read it. So maybe you know, I should just broaden my horizon. And uh, here's uh, Elthelia, uh, Eldalsjam in, in Swedish, and Ödalsku in uh, Elthelia. And Elthelia has 3,000 speakers. You can see here on the little map of Sweden that it's in the heartland of Sweden. And here, this part here, that's Eldalen. That's where they speak it, except for the people who moved somewhere else, for example, to Visby, which is the capital of Gotland. I know. Okay, uh, so uh, Athelian has 3,000 speakers, and almost all are here. It's very different from other varieties uh, of Swedish, which is why it is considered a language rather than a dialect. This is actually pretty new, because before they used to say, like, oh, it's just a dialect, you know? But uh, since it's also incomprehensible to most Swedish speakers, I, I tried to think to it, and uh, I don't understand anything. It's even worse than Danish. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is considered uh, a language. And uh, something that um, the people that speak Athelian have done is that they have standardized Athelian. And they have, if you can read it, they have also their own orthography. So you see here that um, they have like their own letters for their own uh, words. Uh, and uh, just keep these statistics and these facts in mind when I start talking about Gutnisch so that you have a comparison. Um, and one thing that's very interesting about uh, Elthalian is that um, the speakers of Elthalian uh, have talked to the people of the European Union and they want more to be done for their language. They want it to be, to be taught in schools. They want it to be officially recognized. But uh, yeah, and the European uh, Union has written a paper, and at the end it says, uh, we uh, strongly urge the Swedish government to do something about this. And what has the Swedish government done? Well, at least as far as I know, uh, is that they have said, we are in a constant dialogue with the Italian uh, speakers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, when we talk about the language, um, we normally talk about the standard variety. And most people are like, yeah, I speak Italian now, I speak Swedish now, this is great, this is fine, I'll just stop here, because I speak the language. But then we miss a very important part, which are the local dialects and uh, the regional accents. And as you've seen with Castilian, this is actually where language comes from. Because uh, a language is just an artificial standardization of the way people speak. It's just not something that has been God-given or that we find in a grammar book. And when people talk about, oh yeah, this is the way that we form nouns, this is the way that we use suffixes and prefixes, and what's the difference between like uh, being using it in an ergative way or using um, suffixes for it? Well, there is no difference. It's just a way of speaking. And we have just decided that this is the way we're going to call it. We're going to call this ergative. We're going to call this a suffix. But why is it like that? Uh, and uh, what I think is that we shouldn't stop when we've learned the standard language. We shouldn't just stop and say, oh, I speak Swedish now, so you know, it's fine. Like, can you understand how the people speak in Badland? Have you been there? Try it out. Um, 
And, um, and as you know, uh, like standard language can change depending on what comes in from the dialects, uh, new words and also new ways of speaking. Um, everything changes, even Danish. So for me, uh, the question of dialects is uh, a personal journey. And um, yes, yeah, so my father is from the island of Gotham. He was born there, he grew up there, and then he moved uh, to the mainland. And um, the way some people speak on Gotham, I can't understand it at all. And this, I think, is a very personal example of how languages change. So he moved to the mainland. And what happened was, he went into a store, and he wanted to buy a book. So he said, uh, Harley Nora Booker Hair. Uh, Jeff is looking at me and smiling, because I'm probably mangling that a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's actually from the islands. If you have any questions where you want like the real answer to, you should ask him. <laughs> After this talk. <laughs> 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 So what he wanted was vukar, which are books. But what they said was, you, we don't have any vukar here. You should go out and you know go find a store where they uh, you know make things out of wood, because what you want is a box. <laughs> <laughs> and what he wanted was a book. And as you can see, vukar. Um, that's how you would like write the, the dialect, kind of how it's translated. And um, uh, this is the, the standard Swedish word for it, but yeah. So if you would have pronounced it book yeah, uh, everyone would have understood him. So at least that's how he explained it to me. That was one of the most important situations when he realized that I have to learn to speak like they do on mainland. I have to do that, otherwise people won't take me seriously. I can have a career, and basically, it's much easier navigating if you don't speak that. And uh, a guidebook, um, that's uh, like how you say um, in Vietnam, um, yeah. And that's what? That thing here, yeah. <laughs> in uh, the dialect that I spoke. So it was very clear uh, to someone speaking uh, Yiddish that he wanted uh, and um, it was actually last year at uh, Adriano uh, Morelli's talk about Save the Dialects that I started thinking like, oh, dialects, maybe they are important. Maybe I should learn a dialect. And then I started thinking, so what, what could I do? You know, what could I do? Chinese, oh, Chinese is so far away, I don't speak Mandarin. What about Italian? Oh, man, he says, sounds so cool. But it's all so far away, and I have to learn a language in order to learn the dialect. And then one day I realized, my father's from an island where they speak in almost incomprehensible dialect. Maybe I should look into this. Maybe I should. So I, I, I did. And um, this is the presentation that came out of that. Uh, so dialects in Swedish culture, as you might have understood, have had a history of not being uh, very well seen. Like it's not something that you're supposed to, to speak on television. Uh, and um, and out in society unless you're out in the country. Uh, this, of course, has changed. I'm going to go into that. But basically, there are class differences. If you're from a working class, I guess the way it is everywhere. If you're from a working class, you would rather speak a dialect than like a standard Polish variety. If you're a man, you would probably speak more dialect than a woman. Uh, older people rather than younger. Rural rather than city folks. And um, uh, this is also true for Gotland. Uh, there have been uh, some research about that. Uh, so um, how do people uh, use this dialect? Well, it's mostly been used for comedy. There's a famous uh, comedian called uh, Baba. And um, uh, I remember her from television when I was young, and she's always very funny, and she always spoke very strangely, uh, which was uh, and uh, there's also uh, Keino, uh, which is a lottery. And uh, they took uh, uh, Gyrgyzstan's way of speaking as uh, like their unique selling point, um, so that you could distinguish it from uh, other lotteries. 
and this is something that is true today, that you can use your dialect as a unique selling point for yourself. So if someone calls you and wants to sell you a pair of socks, you won't buy them if they're from the big city, because you know, you know, it's just a slick person from the city trying to hold you over. But if they come from somewhere where you can trust, you know, it's the heartland of Sweden or somewhere rural, you know, most socks are pretty good socks. Uh, so this is a bit more how it's viewed today, more in a positive way than it used to be. But probably society has changed so much already that we probably lost a lot of the dialects already. Okay, so um, this is now uh, the Keino uh, uh, So you will hear a bit of Gokyarsky. Uh, Eastern Nordic variety, uh, but I mean it's very distinct. So I think it's clear that all Yupish was its own language. And yeah, uh, you see here down here, there's also another Gothic language um, spoken, um, uh, English and other Germanic languages. Uh, but the earliest communications uh, from the people of uh, Gothland uh, consist of these picture stones. And uh, they're from 400 to 700 uh, common era. And they're very distinct and different from uh, the kinds of stones and pictures that you would find on the mainland. Um, and it's very interesting because we don't know what religion they had in ancient times on this island. We assume that they have the same religion as they do on Iceland at the time uh, because of the old sagas that, uh, that we still can read today. But it was very far away. So how do we know that it's actually a religion that they have? And this is also, so at this time at least, at least we invite the uh, invented time sheets, um, the only thing that we know from this time on uh, Uh And I'm going to read uh, to you in uh, old uh, Yupnish. And uh, you can tell me I'm uh, mangling the uh, pronunciation, but no one speaks it anymore. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so this is the origin story of Gotland. Because Scotland has its own mythology, it has its own origin story, and it's different from, well, the rest of Sweden. So, um, the first man that came to Gotland was Shelva. And Gotland was at the time, so Ilwis, we don't really know what this word means, but the Christians said it's, uh, it was dark. Okay. Uh, and it was so Ilwis that on the days it would sand, and in the night it would go up. And uh, when the first man, Shelba, uh, brought fire to the land, it never sank again. So this is the origin story. So what do we 
we know? Um, we have some writing. We have the Boolean inscriptions, around 300 of them. And this is an example of this from uh, Laju. And uh, the Boolean inscriptions are from around the uh, year 1000. And uh, they're already Christian. So this rune stone um, down here, I just actually cut it off, is a cross. So it was already a very Christian island. And uh, there are very many churches, I think 92 of them, uh, on the island. And what I just read to you, that is the Gyrka Saga. And that is the, the origin story of uh, Gyrka. And this was written down in 1350. Um, and there's also a set of laws, Gyrka Laga. And at this time, um, each uh, county or each part of Sweden had their, had their own set of laws. And uh, they were written down together with the origin story. And um, yeah, so it's, the origins are probably older, but they were written down in 1350. Uh, and you can you can read this. And that's uh, what I read on the page before. Okay, so um, Gotland was like its own nation in, in many ways, uh, but uh, mostly a collection of farmers uh, living on their own farms, on their own homesteads, being very independent. And you can see this still today. In uh, 1361, um, Denmark invaded uh, Gotland. And no, you're not responsible. <laughs> Am I? No. <laughs> And, <laughs> and um, Gotland was Danish until 1645. And there are still uh, words of Danish origin in uh, the uh, Gyrkish way of speaking. Um, it's beyond the scope of this presentation, but uh, there are. Uh, but there are pretty few for such a long time, which shows how independent and how also different it was when you lived on the country. Or, like, the Danes probably didn't go everywhere on the island, they probably stayed where people were rich, which was in the city. So, now let's clear up some concepts. Because I put all of them into the title because they're all words that you use for this language and for dialect. Gyrtamol, Gyrtniske, Gotlandske. They're used somewhat interchangeably in the literature, which makes it a bit difficult when you're looking for resources, for example. So you can look through all of them. But basically, I would do it like this. Fun Gyrtniske, it's the old Gyrtnish, and it was a language. Yeah. You probably translate that as Gotlandic, and I would use that to to, to uh, explain how people speak when they speak Swedish with a regional accent. So the way uh, Jeff speaks when he speaks to me like normally, and I can understand everything, and it just sounds cute. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's also what you heard uh, in the advertising before. Um, because th that's what you would use to talk to like normal, uh, well, uh, mainland Swedish speakers, majority Swedish speakers. <laughs> <laughs> What's normal? <laughs> and uh, um is um, an invented term. It's pretty recent. I'll go into that later. Uh, but it's the term that you would use for modern Gutnish. So if you want to talk about it as if it is a language, and if you really want to to say, you know, this is a language. It's just not a dialect, it's a language. Gyrtamol. So it basically means mol is like a way of speaking or, uh, yeah, has ancient roots. And uh, gyrta just means it has to do with uh, Gotland, gyrtana. And when it comes to the number of speakers of gyrtamol, we have maybe around 500. So if you compare that to Ögdalsku, uh, you had around 3,000. And uh, this number is from Gyrtamos uh, Gillet, which is the uh, society that preserves and promotes uh, the Gyrtanish language. Um, and they have around, I think, 400, 500 um, uh, people in uh, the society. And then there's probably maybe 1,000 that would understand it. Can you turn on? Um, so you can say already now that it is in a precarious uh, place. And if you compare this to the numbers from like around 1990, it was maybe around 1,000. So it has halved in a very short time. 
And this is, of course, a strategy that you can use as a government. Don't do anything. Wait until it dies out, and then you don't have to do anything. OK, so we have some dictionaries, actually, from the 1800s uh, about the Gutenberg language. Um, and one of them consists, uh, is based on 262 letters written from a farmer in Lao Sokil, Feijako. And he wrote them to a grammar school lecturer, Matthias Kindweig. And uh, Matthias Kindweig lived in Visby. And these were actually written in Gutamor. And uh, this is pretty unique because mostly it was like spoken language and not many, very, very many things were written down. But uh, we have these letters still today, and you can listen to them online. I'll post them. I have some sources at the end. And, and then um, we have, uh, uh, yeah, and out of uh, these letters, there has been um, um, a dictionary has been created over the, the way of speaking in Lao, because of course it's a bit different from where they speak in other parts of Gotland. Um, and then we have uh, the Grimm brothers of uh, Gotland, which were uh, Karl and Per Arvid Sabe. And they went around Gotland and like, asked how people talk, because they wanted to, to create a dictionary. They were also, I think, a bit nationalist. Uh, and they created uh, the name Gurtamol uh, for the language in order to uh, also connect it to the old, maybe Gothic background of uh, Gotland. Um, and they collected the many, very many different stories. And uh, some of them are pretty silly. And when you ask people from that part uh, of Gotland today, they will say, that's not true. Who told you that? Uh, so you can see that um, the people of Gotland were probably a bit diverse to being collected and, uh, and like uh, mapped in this way. But uh, still, there's uh, lots that is really true. Like the most part of it, of it is true. And then um, there's been a dictionary made uh, uh, out of this. They created the Brödna Sära. Okay. Um, and what makes Gotlandish um, Gutnish so cute uh, are its diphthongs. Um, and we have none in the standard modern Swedish, but you can argue this. Uh, there's one word, for example, elau, which is uh, from Gutnish. <laughs> it's a long word. Um, but basically, there are no diphthongs in the standard spoken language. Uh, but there were some in the history of uh, the Germanic and the Nordic languages. And uh, I have collected them here. Those are oi, ai, and au. And uh, they've, of course, changed in the standard language. So oi now is the long uh. Yeah. Uh. Okay. And uh, I have some examples. So you have the word here, which is hara. Um, and uh, that is in the Gutnish, uh, it is hoire. So, uh, so if you uh, if you look into the Old Norse, uh, it's probably easier to, to understand um, Gutnish than maybe standard Swedish. I don't know. Um, and then you have uh, the typical concept of raising a rune stone, uh, which we do every day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you would say in, in modern Swedish, you would say Riesa and Stean, Riesa Stean. And uh, in the dialect of uh, Gutnish, in the, the language of uh, Gutnish, you would say Reise Stein. So you see the old A here, which uh, also has been kept, I think has been kept, in uh, the English. And other examples are uh, Bone, Bean, uh, Bein. On, uh, yeah, this uh, I only put this here because uh, bind actually means leg, uh, and bone, of course, uh, yeah, uh, it's not the exact equivalent. But um, in, in order for you to see the etymology, um, this is uh, like the, the easier concepts. Okay. And uh, we have the ow, and as you can see, this is also a long uh, uh. And uh, yeah, it's obviously red in English. Uh, Rö in standard Swedish and uh, Rau in uh, Gutnish. But of course, we have some new diphthongs. Wow, this is exciting! 
what uh, does new mean? It means from the Middle Ages to the 1700s. Wow, this is really new. <laughs> And um, the changes that took place were that the long E was um, transitioned into an A. So uh, we have a more in English, which is, uh, which is Mia in standard Swedish. And this is more like male in uh, Jutnish. Then you have the long U, which is more like a U. And I guess you could say something like you, thou, or skew. Well, those are not good examples, that's why I didn't put them here. So, and you have the U, which is more like an O. So this is the O, and when you put them together, you get something like O. Um, I can pronounce it on its own, I'll just do it with the, with the words. So you have something like a county, and um, Gotham has a number of them. And uh, they're called Sukjen in standard Swedish. But of course, on Gotham, they're more like Sokjen. So you hear that uh, something that is normally like a short vowel, sukken, because you have the double uh, consonants here, is more uh, long, so it's a bit long. So again. Uh, you also have the short U in the history of the language, and that is more like an AU. Uh, so you have the house, you have hus, and you have uh, hoist. Hughes. Hughes, Hughes, sorry. Not German. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hughes. Yeah, I, I would normally write with the normal E instead of an A, so it's confusing to me. Uh, Hughes, yeah. Which is very cute, I think. <laughs> then you have the Y, which is more like an Ö. Uh, so you have a Grim. I did translate this to English. Can someone just shout it out? Grim. Uh, uh, yeah, grain. Yeah, no, grain. Yeah, we just did it. Oh, cool. Uh, green, uh, grain, grain. Yeah. So you see the changes that uh, Gutnish is a language that has acquired more diphthongs. So in a way, it has become more complex. Okay, so we have some interesting stuff with the consonants as well. So. Uh, if you've ever learned Swedish, you've seen um, our uh, nice words like kulta, stjärna, juta, ljus, which are very beautiful and sometimes a bit difficult. Uh, and they're also pronounced in different ways depending on where you live. So it's not always uh, very important to know if you say like sjusjömen or sjusjömen or sjusjömen, something like that. Uh, but all of these have different spellings in standard Swedish, but they only get like one uh, one sound uh, f for this, uh, this uh, for all of these for this combination exactly. Uh, but what ma what makes a Yiddish so great is that all of the silent letters are pronounced. So finally, you can learn how to spell it. Just <laughs> uh, and I have an example. So if you come from the mainland and uh, you're cruising on Gotland and uh, uh, you want to go to uh, Jupvik and then you ask someone like, oh, where's uh, Jupvik? And they will be like, what do you mean? Well, okay, most people are no tourists, so they would know what they meant, but then they would be like, ah, you mean Jaupvik. <laughs> <laughs> because of course you pronounce the D in Jupvik, which means um, uh, deep. Yeah. Deep Bay. Deep Bay, exactly. Yeah. Which is uh, pretty close to where my, my father grew up, and that's where he went uh, dancing in the evening when he was young. <laughs> okay, and uh, you have, I have another example, human, men in uh, standard Swedish, the way I speak at least. And this is more like a men's get uh, on the uh, Hmm? That sounds Danish. Mm. Yes, uh, it sounds yeah. Danish, doesn't it? Uh, and uh, so you hear that this is, uh, this has no chia sound, but you actually pronounce the silent letters. You pronounce the whole combination. So more about consonants. If you've ever learned uh, Swedish, you know that when you go to Göteborg, you don't go to Göteborg, you go to Göteborg. So the G, the initial G and the final G are soft. And this is because of our soft vowels. The front vowels, E, I, I, A, and Ö, they, um, they change the consonants so that they uh, are pronounced soft. 
And one example of this is for uh, cheese stack, uh, which is uh, like a chest. And uh, this is, of course, cheese step on Gokta. And you also have the gi in many different combinations. For example, went, gik, which is uh, more like uh, gik. Or in he says, uh, han seje, han segar, which is a bit different. And as you heard, at least I tried it, um, R is more English than in the standard Swedish. Uh, so, segar uh, more than segen. But of course, the R is pronounced differently all over Sweden, and Jeff asked me to, to also say that, you know, maybe not everyone actually says the R the English way. Okay, now I have an interesting excerpt from a radio show. There was actually a radio show from 1989 to 2011 uh, where they spoke for one hour in Gutamål. And uh, you could uh, write your own text and send them in and then they would read them loud. And this is one of the texts that we are going to listen to. And uh, it is about a time where there were visitors in the house and uh, they didn't speak the way that people did where they did. And uh, then they came a cat and he brought in a rat and he put it on the, uh, on the mat. And uh, the people from the, the city folks, they started like, ah, it's a cat, it's a rat. What's a rat doing here? And they were like, why are they screaming about this? So now you know what it's about. And now try to listen and, and hear what, uh, what they say. So I try to mark the special places uh, where you can notice what makes a difference. Then I'm going to Det var främre sig hos ett helg på hausten, det är tråsktiden. Hosmål, jag hade det på saffranspolar och torto, så att det måste ha varit årsdagar. Främres var något gammalt folk av den sorten som gav med kollar, och de pratade inte som folk i kring er, och vad de skrejade och haltade. Det här kom in och hjälpte åt och mitt på bästmattor. Vad är det något i skrej för att Stockholm kan väl behöva lära sig vad vi har stål och låta sig ut. Katto ber de ut i kåse och låta visst i andra vad de gör där. Okej, så nu har du hört det. Det är inte så bra. Okej, så... Like Wait. some things you understand and some things you don't. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, something interesting about uh, Jutnish is the consonant assimilation. Uh, so in some places uh, there has been no assimilation. You have in English uh, evening, standard Swedish kväll, Jutnish more like kväll, where you actually pronounce the final B. Uh, Earth, mull, mull, lamb. Lam, lam, and uh, lam uh, also has a lexical difference because the lam <laughs> is not only the the young uh, uh, lam, but uh, also the the grown up ones. Uh, and then you have a simulation that has taken place in some cases, uh, which is very interesting. And sometimes, you know, for me it sounds a bit childish because. It's not pronounced the correct way, so you think maybe a child that couldn't pronounce all the consonants would pronounce it that way. But of course, it's, you know, those are differences that happen in a language. Uh, so for place, plats, plats, child, barn, barn, hoon, hoon, uh, horn, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> horn, hoon, hon, dangerous, holly. So you see that uh, quite a lot of consonants maybe have been dropped in some places. Uh, so simplification has taken place in some places, and in some places it has gotten more complex. It's extremely interesting. Um, but one of the interesting things about Gutnisch is that there's no standardization, maybe a little. Uh, so for example, for the word <laughs> for the word window is in standard Swedish. Fönster. Yeah. In modern Gutnis, you can say Fönster, 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 
Um, and I think the pronunciation should actually be a bit different, but I couldn't really find any resources for this uh, on uh, for and in flea. So uh, finster and finster. Uh, and uh, you can see that this is basically the same word. It's not really a big difference, but still you have some vowels that are different. Um, and as you probably know, if you're interested in languages, uh, you know that window comes from the Old Norse uh, Vindauge, and this has been kept for a certain lexical meaning in Gutlich, which is when you have a finstar in um, a scene, then you call it a Vindauge. And uh, on four you call it a Vindauge because they're a bit different. That could be Okay, uh, so I have actually told you everything. Wow, this went so fast. Uh, and um, I wanted to um, to play a piece for you, um, which is from uh, the Gokland band uh, Smaklösa. And uh, <laughs> tasteless, yes, Schmacklos. Uh, they are, they make songs about cods. The cod, you know, the fish. Uh, and uh, this is a very famous song. You will definitely recognize it when uh, I start playing it. And uh, afterwards, I will uh, sum up and also say some things about a uh, dialect and, and language. Klockan är kvart över. Välkomna nyheter från Gotlands radio. Och gissa om vi har nyheter för er. Alla ni lantbrukare, ta och spetsa öronen. Skruva upp volymen och ha upp på riktigt rejält. Barometern faller. Månen går rätt låg. I kväll ser det som på i. Ska alla bonder passa på. För i kväll vid tio pläcket. Så kommer det att gå in och stort För första gången någonsin Så kommer det att regna kol Det regnar Why I went up to them and got their autograph. 
Um, when I was nine. <laughs> um, yes, which is very interesting because you see it's not standardized and the way people speak is different. And it depends on what you're doing and who you are, what you say and what you don't. So what you heard right now was again, of course, the dialect, I would say, more like Gotlandic, rather than Gutnisch. There is music in Gutnisch as well, of course. Um, as you heard, uh, the intro music, for example, was more uh, Gutnisch. Um, but this, I understood it uh, you all. Know, exactly, but you still have some of the differences. So, um, if I sum up this a bit. Gotland has its own mythology, it has its own mythos, it has its own consonants. It has an incredible richness in vocabulary that I think would be a shame to like standardize out and say, no, you say it wrong, it's Funstar here, it's not Funstar. Um, it has around 500 speakers, and hopefully after this presentation, it will have <laughs> 501. <laughs> And when it comes to the question, if it is a dialect or a language, I think uh, Victor is right. I think um, it's a part of the dialect continuum. I think these are dialects. But I think this is something that's well worth preserving. And in order to do that, I think we need to give it the status of a language. I think we need to say this is a language. Because I don't think people understand that dialects are worth saving. So if we say this is the language of uh, the island where my father comes from, people will be like, oh yeah, can I learn it? And yes, you can. <laughs> uh, so interesting. Uh, I just have two questions, and I have very limited knowledge, so please anyone uh, fix that for me. Uh, first, I'm interested in the difference in uh, like dialect and language when it's referred to in Swedish, because it was my impression that if you have this more ending, then it's talking about dialects, and the scop is going to extend southeast and scop. So it seems backwards to call it the more. Yeah, but I think this is because it harkens back to ancient times. Uh, yeah. So you would be like, wow, that's the way they spoke in ancient times. I want to speak that. Mol, mol is old knowledge for language. Yes, yeah. exactly. mother tongue is mol, mol. Yeah, mol. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very interesting talk. Yeah, great talk. But, uh, yeah, so one thing I was thinking of, you were talking about how you showed some examples where Swedish became, uh, you know, you're comparing modern Swedish and Gotlandska, uh, uh, and so, in some cases one was more complex, and in the other cases the other one was more complex. And I was thinking possibly, I think, you, and, and this might explain some of the similarity with Danish and like Northern Norwegian, is that that the standards, some of the cases, the standard Swedish became simplified, and the, the, the Gotlandish was originally that, and it stayed that way. Yeah, in some ways like the, it is, like because you have some victims that stay the same. Uh, you, you had a question? No, I was just commenting on, on your comment, sorry. <laughs> Since we have Gotlandska already established as the dialect in, in normal Swedish when you talk about it, I think that's why they chose to call it uh, 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 But yeah. If you, uh, all three of uh, your four examples were Gotlandska more and one was different, I kind of just about that, but I have to say that uh, I think there's a pattern there. It gets uh, less as, uh, it gets less assimilated in almost all cases, except a few where the working car is the most uh, productive. I just realized that I had two questions. I did. Yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, the second one was about uh, the comparison slides with uh, like mod uh, is it with modern Swedish? I mean, yes, modern standard Swedish. Okay, yeah. Yeah, this MSS. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, and English and then Gutenberg. But I found it interesting that there was no comparison with like the North Germanic, like uh, mainland Europe. It seemed like in some of the examples, not with like Fed, because then it doesn't fit. Yeah, but with house, for example, that house is a diphthong. Yes. Uh, in house, in, that's house. Those are close to like German yes. diphthongs. Yeah. I thought that was interesting uh, to note. 
yeah, it's it's more of a time constraint thing for me that I just didn't do that. And one thing that I also didn't mention is that there are actually grammar uh, and sentence structure differences in uh, Gutemol that you don't have in standard Swedish. I just couldn't go into this, but the definite form is also different in some cases. So what would be wrong grammatically in standard Swedish is completely correct if you're a Lapland. But are they be more dramatic like or more? No, they're just they just sound wrong. Just a matter. But the differences, like, do they look more like those we know from any other? No, I think it's. I mean, to me, it sounds. It looks very unique. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure you you think about the dialect continuum. Some of the words, because I don't know much Norwegian, some of the words you're pronouncing, I find like strange. Oh, you did say that. I found Yeah. I was wondering if some of the consonant pronunciation would be like close to Norwegian, like, like, um, so maybe Sweden is. I, I would say I have no idea. Ask Victor after. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Tosin. How, how does the uh, mall handle the gender? Like both in terms of uh, like genders and the, the nouns having gender, and also the topic you mentioned about Swedish trying to add another pronoun. If that applies in the law as well. Well, uh, well, the pronoun they could use in the Utomol, I guess. Hem. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know. Yet. Yeah, we'll have to ask the experts at Utomol what they want, uh, and <laughs> they can include it. They want to. Hem is pretty recent in Swedish uh, standard yeah. Swedish history as well. Uh, so, uh, do they uh, distinguish uh, masculine and feminine? Because I saw they say they rotto, they rotto. If they do distinguish masculine and feminine, uh, and there's actually like when you use it in dative and in the different cases, they treat them differently. And you can hear this when people speak, even when they speak uh, Gotlandska, even when they speak like just the dialect that normal people should understand. Sorry, <laughs> normal again. When the when a tourist comes, they they would still say something that has. Um, I could recommend a Friedrich Lindström dialect to steer it for that, uh, because he actually goes into that uh, in in one episode. Um, so, so in other words, they have three genders, just like dialects on Norwegian and on Norwegian. Yes, I, I would say that. Yeah, that's that's my impression so far. But I don't speak it uh, yet. I hope to do that maybe next year. Yes. Hey, just a couple of quick points. Yeah, so that this really is a global issue, the question about dialect and languages, yeah. yeah. I don't want to make fun of Minnesotans, but to me some of that sounded like a Minnesotan trying to speak Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> well, then they should go to Gotla on vacation. And you can do that too. Wow, I just forgot one thing. I know uh, the time is up, but I have two things with me. If you want to check them out, uh, I have uh, old uh, Gotlandska saga. Uh, so if you want to read some old uh, Gotlandska stories, uh, you can look up them here. They are, of course, in standard Swedish in MSS. I just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to go on vacation to Gotland, do that because it's beautiful, and as it says here. Um, that no matter where you go, it's beautiful and you have the whole world on one island because some parts uh, really look like uh, as if you're on a safari in Africa somewhere. And you can find Kuta Saga in Great Affairs. You can find the Kuta Saga on Game of Life because I found it there. Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My uh, my last slide. Of course, the learning sources. Check them out. Uh, so you have the society, which is Gutenberg uh, here. This is their uh, their web page, and uh, there you can find the uh, the dictionary, um, which contains like all of the variations that you saw with the window. Uh, we also have some music sheets uh, from Gotland's Uh which is like uh, the music from Gotland. 
They have a Bible in uh, Germany? Yes, you have the Bible translated into Gürtel yet. And this is online as we have in Com. It's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> and that's usually a good sign for being a language, isn't it, to have a Bible? Yeah. Yes, it's a very good sign. Uh -huh. yeah. You should open the Wikipedia. Oh, yeah, yeah, we should. Which was a common place. And then there's a university course that you can take. It was at least given last year. They stopped making them in Germany. And you can find the dictionary from Gutenberg Mozilla's app on iPhone and Android app so that you can check up, like, oh, what was window again? Uh, but of course, this is Swedish Gutenberg, so you have to learn Swedish first, but you know. Uh, and uh, you can listen to what I just uh, told you, Gutenberg's uh, radio, the excerpt uh, I played. Uh, on this webpage, you can find all, and you can download them as podcasts, so you can have like your daily one hour of Gutenberg. <laughs> Um, and uh, you have Gyuta Saga, uh, which was the story I told you about the origin story in Italian, translated by Diego Rossi. And uh, of course, you should check out the Gyuta Mol resources here from the Almada Library. And if you have any questions about that, we have a librarian from uh, Almada's uh, Bibliothek, which is let you click this over there. <laughs> Yeah. Can I add one more link here that possibly has good links? Yes. It's called Project Runeberg. Yeah, Project yeah. Runeberg, yeah. of course. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. I'll just add that.